Okay. So um, we've got, thank you for joining. Um, we're going to record it like this. A few people who are not able to join today will um, be able to join. Um, okay. Let's adjust this camera. I'm using uh, my husband's um, <clears throat> Zoom in his office. So uh, this background is his. Um, Feel free at any point to mute your, unmute yourselves, to ask any questions or to add any input. Um, although it's a, you know, Zoom class, some interaction um, is always great. Okay, so today we will, are continuing the Perke Avot series. Um, last week, I believe it was Hindi and um, she began again with chapter one, and today we're going to be reading and learning about chapter two. So the Pirkei Avot is divided into six chapters with lots of little mish, mishnas, which are little, um, say, paragraphs of insights and wisdom that are all actually based um, originally on the Mishnah, the book that the um, that was was written by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi after the destruction of the temples he was noticing and the sages of the time were noticing that many people were starting to forget the laws and practices the customs and rituals and so he together with his um, colleagues of sages they sat down and wrote the Mishnah, which eventually um, the Talmud was eventually written and derived from the Mishnah, many, many, many books. And today we actually know all the laws, right? Because the Torah is divided written Torah and oral Torah. And the oral Torah teaches us how to keep the laws commanded in the written Torah, right? In the written Torah, for example, in the Shema, it tells us that we need to have a mezuzah on our doorpost. The oral Torah explains exactly what it needs to look like, what needs to be written inside, what scroll and parchment is needed. So the oral Torah is the fact that we have it all clear and the halakha and the laws in how to keep the Torah are all thanks to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who also was responsible for writing and compiling the Pirkei Avot. He, um, He's quoted the most in the Pirkei Avot with teachings and studies, and he was a really a great, great leader who ensured the Torah's continuation by documenting it and writing it all down. So we're going to get right into chapter two. Um, a few, July, June 17th, I believe, um, Malka taught the first Mishnah, um, the first little chapter, well, not really chapter, the first paragraph in this Mishnah, which was so insightful. So feel free to check the YouTube, um, the Shul's YouTube account and scroll down and you can find it. For now, we're going to be continuing with the second uh, verse or paragraph in the Pirkei Avot. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Let me know if you'd like to see it on the screen and I can figure that out. Um, but number two in the Pirkei Avot of chapter two says, um, Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi would say, Yafe Talmud Torah im derech Eretz. Beautiful is the study of Torah with the way of the world. So, what does it mean, the way of the world? And so Derech Eretz is literally translates as the way of the world. But colloquially, what we all refer to as Derech Eretz is respect, common decency. And we, um, as in Judaism, we take pride and we take very so much importance in treating our fellow human beings with 
the utmost respect. Every single person is a human being and entitled to all that comes with it and never to look down at anybody or think less of um, or more of somebody else. So as we know in the Pirkei Avot and to be honest, in most areas of the Torah, there are so many ways to interpret one sentence, even one word. And we're going to look at a few rabbis who learn and discuss and share what they took out from this phrase. So the first, um, the first person, the first person um, we're going to um, hear their perspective is that they say that this phrase says, beautiful is Torah with Derech Eres, the way of the world, means having an occupation, having a job. And he says, it's great to study Torah. It's great to be involved in learning Torah, but it's so important to, at the same time, have a job as well. Firstly, a job keeps a person busy, out of trouble, right? Maybe there's only so many hours a person can sit and learn all day. So a job is important to keep a person on track, focused. But more than that, um, a job really teaches a person successful habits, right? A person needs to wake up in the morning to be on time for their job. They need to be accountable for certain tasks. They need to sit and stay dedicated to the task at hand. There's a lot of tools and areas of growth and that happen in the structure of a job. And so this um, explanation, this um person really is sharing with us that a job really gives us tools for life um that how to be successful and we need to apply those similar lessons that we learn when we have a job right um i Myra in the office a while ago, her son, her teenage son got a job and she was so happy and, you know, shared with me how, you know, it's so important for teenagers, you know, I don't have any teenagers, um, but to start working a job, they really learn and it's an introduction to becoming a successful adult. And just as we wake up, are accountable in a job, we need to apply those similar habits when learning Torah. We need to wake up, stay dedicated to a topic at hand. We need to apply similar habits and having a job helps us to be successful in Torah as well so that um, we make the most of our time. Um, another explanation on this um, phrase, Yafet Talmud Torah in Derech Eretz, says Derech Eretz also means a job. And what their, this person, the next explanation says, is that when you're studying, when you're having your job and working, it's beautiful if you're able to carve out time during your busy work day and to study some Torah. Log in online, you know, at Chabad.org or at a Torah website and listen, read some words of Torah. Or every Wednesday, you can uh, take a break from work and come to Worth Avenue to hear Rabbi Shiner or Rabbi Yosef give a lunch and learn class for an hour. So this person says, working is something we all need to do. And it's so beautiful if you're able to carve out time during your busy day to dedicate to Torah. The next person's explanation on this phrase, and it's so beautiful to see so many opinions and so many insights and lessons to learn from just these five words. The next person says that im derech eretz, the way of the world, refers to action, right? Beautiful is Torah with action. And um, I'm sure you've heard of this concept before that it's beautiful to learn Torah and to study and be intellectually stimulated and enjoy and be inspired. But it's so important that the Torah leads to action, leads you to being a better, comp more compassionate person, leads you to doing the mitzvot. And 
enhancing your home with Judaism. So action is really important. And that's beauty in Torah when you can bring it to action. And um, the last explanation we're going to go with, go into this on this phrase is we touched upon it right at the beginning. Derech Eretz means respect and um, being a mensch, right? Common decency, being respectful. And Torah is beautiful when it's accompanied with being a mensch, with being a good person, with being respectful, with being kind. And he even goes on to say that you could follow all the Torah mitzvot, um, say you can keep certain mitzvot keep perfectly, but if you don't, if you're not treating another person with respect, then your Torah is not beautiful. You're not accomplishing the ideal at all, because real beauty in Torah study and in Torah is when you are transformed to be a nicer, better person to all those around you. Um, so, does anyone have anything to add on that? That they also um, heard or, okay, great. So now we're going to continue on bet the, um, the next one. Um, and, um, I could, I'll quickly read through the entire, um, little paragraph, even though we won't touch on every single point in it. So he continues, um, Beautiful is the study of Torah with the way of the world, for the toil of them both causes sin to be forgotten. Ultimately, all Torah study that is not accompanied with work is destined to cease and to cause sin. Those who work for the community should do so for the sake of heaven, for then merits of their ancestors shall aid them, and their righteousness shall endure forever. And you, God, shall credit them with great reward as you, if you have achieved it. So this concludes bet the what rabbi gamliel says and he concludes saying for those that are in a position of leadership in their community and he himself was a communal leader so he's speaking from his experience and from his perspective as that role and he says it's so important when you are a communal leader that you're not doing it for the money that you're not doing it for respect that you're doing it genuinely to be there for the community, for the sake of God. And um, he says, only in that way, with that perspective, will a person have success in that. And I think we we can all agree that, you know, sometimes you can pick up if somebody has an ulterior motive of why they're in a certain position or doing something, and people automatically connect to and really um, appreciate when something is done for the sake of the greater good and for the sake of God. Now we're going to look at Gimel. And Gimel says, Heve zahirin barashut, be wary of those in power, for they befriend a person only for their own needs. They appear to be friends when it is beneficial to them, but they, they do not stand by a person at the time of his distress. So this sounds, whoa, you know, this sounds quite... Uh, harsh where be wary of those in power um this doesn't seem to be so in line with perke avot which is ethics of our fathers which values of being accepting respectful but there's two explanations um the first one is obviously um just on the surface level be be wary of politicians unfortunately um, politicians sometimes are not 100% honest and sometimes they do have certain motives that we don't know. And so just on a surface level, um, Ravin Gamliel is telling us, don't put all your faith and all your resources in a politician. Um, unfortunately, they should not be relied on completely. Um, but for, but further into this and deeper, what Rowan Gamliel really, really was trying to send us a message was, be careful of those in power. Now, of yourself, who is, who is a power that controls us? It is our mind 
our hearts and sometimes our yetzer hara, our evil inclination, starts to mess with our minds or with our hearts and starts to rationalize. This behavior is totally fine. Look, everybody else is doing it. Or it's totally okay to have that temptation or give in to that temptation. So our hearts and our minds who are ultimately in charge of ourselves, they are responsible for all our thoughts, our actions. Rabbi Gamliel is saying, be careful, be wary of your thoughts and actions. Don't always um, take what your mind is saying immediately, process it. Wait, is this, am I, is this genuinely a good thing to be doing? Um, right? Very often we sometimes rationalize and that something is okay when it isn't, or that something's good for somebody when it might not be. And so be wary, hold a step back. Don't, uh, you know, contemplate something before you do it. Think over something. Be wary that your thoughts and minds are coming from the right place and not from the evil inclination, not from the Yetzahara, because sometimes it pretends to be our friend. It pretends that, of course, you need to go and, you know, buy that huge cake. It won't cause you to, you know, gain any weight. Of course, you need to. And sometimes, of course, we're talking about all different areas that our minds sometimes lead us astray. And um, that's the real message of this verse in Pirkei Avot. Be wary of our minds and hearts because sometimes they may lead us astray and we need to um, not act impulsively. And um, now we're going to continue to number four. Um, oh, and, and just to conclude, the concluding of number three says, they do not stand by a person at the time of his distress. Your heart and mind and your evil inclination doesn't support you when your choice is made, when you accidentally make an incorrect choice. They don't fight for you and defend you um, saying, it's my fault, I made you rationalize. They don't. It's something that uh, we need to just be aware of. So number four, um, this, is still Rabbi Gamliel, and he used to say also, make that his will should be your will, so that he should make your will to be as his will. Nullify your will before his will, so that he should nullify the will of others before your will. And there are so many um, explanations on this. Wait, what does this mean? That if you, um, if you do what God wants, God will do what you want. And if you, and then God will, will make other people do what you want, others do what you want. What does this mean? And we're just going to touch up on it in one moment, but there are so many beautiful explanations and so many more um, sages who analyze this and go really deep into it. But on a surface level, um, this is something I think that we all um, can you know, relate to, right? Even in a relationship, when you are good to somebody, their response they respond in kind, they respond positively. And unfortunately, the other way around, when you're rude and disrespectful to somebody, they usually respond similarly. And so this, Rabbi Gamil is saying, God as well is similar to this. When you put aside your own will for what God wants, then God is going to put aside what he, his will for you. God is going to answer your prayers for what you want. And God acts in this way as well. And so just on a service level, it's also a reminder of all of our relationships. When we interact with somebody, be take note of how we're interacting because that's usually how they will respond. And of course, we all want um, positive and positive relationships and connections when we meet other people. Um, it also, it continues now with Hillel. Hillel now, um, shares his ethics of and his values. And before we get into what he said, I just want to tell you a little bit about Hillel. There's so much to say about Hillel. Um, 
and he was a uh, incredible incredible sage and he actually um was very famously known to be so kind and gentle and patient with people um he his way of teaching was from chesed love and and his associate um shammai right i'm sure you've heard of hillel and shammai and shammai way and his method was with gvara, stringency, with boundaries, with caution. And uh, sometimes he was known to be quite strict or a little harsh. But Hillel was love. Um, in fact, most of the laws that we see, right, that we have in the Torah, very often, especially a lot of discussions in the Mishnah and the Talmud, are discussions between Hillel and Shammai. And Hillel is always the one who is, or mostly, always the one who is more lenient, more, um, less strict with, with laws and less rigid. So once um, two of Reb Hillel's um, students or people that lived in his town made a bet. They said, you know what? I promise you, I have never seen Hillel upset, angry, losing his temper. If you can make him lose his temper, I will give you 400 zuz. And in those days, that was a lot, a lot of money. And so the other fellow, wow, a quick way to earn some money. I'm going to conjure up a plan to make Hillel lose his temper. And so he set out to... Reb Hillel's home on Erev Shabbat. And in most homes, um, Erev Shabbat is very hectic, busy day. And he began knocking on the door and he, Hillel would, Reb Hillel would answer the door and this man, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And this man would start asking Hillel the silliest questions. Why is a person's head a round shape? And Hillel would say, you know, make the man feel very good for asking his silly question and uh, his unnecessary question. And right, he didn't want him to be embarrassed or stop to ever ask questions again. And so he was so patient with him and he was talking and explaining his you know, the answers as best he could and answering. And the man said, thank you so much. And he left. And a couple hours later, he comes back. And remember, this is on a Friday afternoon. Everything's hectic. Everyone's preparing for Shabbat. And in those days, preparing for Shabbat took much longer than in today's time. They didn't have technology like we do today that makes things, our lives much more efficient. And so this man kept pestering Reb Hillel again and again with silly, insignificant questions that were not to really get an answer, but just to try and get Reb Hillel to lose his temper. And each and every time that he would knock on the door and occupy Reb Hillel's time with very insignificant um, requests and questions, Reb Hillel was so respectful, so patient, and at the end of the Friday, this man was, that's it, I had no success. And he, of course, for, could not win the bet and get the 400 zuz, but it just shows us what kind of person Reb Hillel was, how he was so patient, even in the mo even to some pestering person, even to, even on, on at a hectic time. And so he used to say, um, he used to say, don't separate yourself from the community. Do not believe in, in yourself until the day you die. Do not judge your fellow until you have stood in his place. Do not say something that is not readily understood in the belief that it will ultimately be understood. 
and do not say when I free myself of my concerns, I will study. And he also says, don't say something that should not be heard, even in the strictest confidence for ultimately it will be heard. Um, so there's quite a few tidbits of wisdom that he shares. Um, and of course, we're not going to go deeply into what each one means and can refer to, but on a surface level, we can appreciate um, this, his profound messages. Don't separate yourself from the community. Um, we all know how wonderful and how beneficial it is to be part of a community. And of course, this is not talking about a negative community or a community that is not healthy for a person, but um, very often a person will seclude themselves from a community out of arrogance. That's what Rev Hillel is saying. Very often a person will feel, if a person might feel they're better than their community and they don't need to associate with people maybe a little different to them. And so Rav Hillel says, um, don't think you're so great. Don't believe in yourself so much. Don't separate from the community. Um, you, it's important to be part of one. Next is the famous, uh, famous, famous quote from Reb Hillel. I'll, to, I'll um, let me find the Hebrew words. Al tadin es chavercha ad shetagielim komo. Do not judge your fellow until you have reached his place. And of course, we know we can never judge anybody because we will never even reach his place, right? If you can never reach a person's place, you never can be in their circumstance because you weren't raised the way they were raised, you weren't exposed to the things they were exposed to. And so every person has no right to judge another person because they will never understand the other person's mind, the other person's experiences, which have shaped them. Another explanation um, is that until you reach his place, Makom is actually a name, uh, one of the na many names of God. And so according to that explanation, don't judge a person until you reach God's place, until you are, until you're God, basically, which means, of course, nobody can be God, nobody is God. And this explanation shares with us that really only God is the one who knows what a person is going through, what a person is dealing with, right? We can all try to imagine what a person might be dealing with on a surface level or even from what they've shared with us. But God is really the only one that knows truly the depths of a person. And so because you will never be God, we cannot judge another person. And just a reminder that it's God who knows everybody and who also is responsible for creating their lives that way, you know, who orchestrated that they were born in such and such place and such home with such families around family around them. And um, we are not God. And so we cannot um, claim to know and to have opinions on other people. The next um, one, number five, Hillel would also say, a boor cannot be sin-fearing, an ignoramus cannot be pious, a bashful one cannot learn, a short-tempered person cannot teach, nor does anyone who does much business grow wise in a place where there are no men strive to be a man. So this is quite interesting. There are a lot of explanations, what does this all mean? Um, that a boy cannot be sin-fearing, uh, somebody in ignorant cannot be pious. We're not going to go into it, um, but what we will go into is the last phrase that he concludes this Mishnah with, and it is, "Bemakom she'ein anashim hishtadel liyot ish, in a place where there are no men, strive to be a man. And Hillel would know to what does this mean, and it, what it means is when there are no, when there's nobody around you that is capable or who's being a man, which means being a leader, being the better person, 
you should strive to be that person. And Hillel said this because this was his experience. He came to into a town and he was asked a halachic question. He was asked a very difficult question and he was the only person who was able to answer that question. And in turn, they asked him to please become their rabbi. And he was hesitant. He didn't want to become this rabbi. He's visiting this town. And he looked around, he saw, this is a place that has no men that can answer questions or know as much as I can. I need to step up and be the man. And so he stepped up and he agreed to the position of leadership. And um, this, there's so many um, ways that a person can step up and do the right thing, right? Sometimes you're in a busy, crowded area and somebody needs help, right? God forbid somebody's choking or somebody needs some help right? Sometimes everybody relies on each other, right? Nobody's standing up to go and help them. So in a place where there are no people volunteering, there are no people getting up to help, you be that person. You get up and go and help out um, when that situation comes up. And um, another explanation on this um, is in a place where there are no men, in a place where there are no people, strive to be a man. What does that refer to? In a place where there are no people, right? There's nobody watching you. There's nobody, the, you're not out of the public eye in your own home where you don't have access to people, people who are looking at you. There too, you should strive to be a man, right? Unfortunately, behind closed doors and in some homes, horrible things happen or people don't behave so greatly, right? Or people aren't as patient at home as maybe they are outside in the public eye. And so this teaching says how important it is that when you're in your home, you're still a mensch, you're still being respectful to your environment and still being respectful to those who live in your home and to and still being and acting proper and uh, just as you would act out in public. Um, so that was also another explanation on this verse. Um, okay. Now we're going to read number six. Um, and this one is quite interesting and quite cryptic and we're gonna go into it. Um, he also saw a skull floating on the water. He said to it, because you drowned others, you were drowned, and those who drowned you will themselves be drowned. Okay, this is extremely strange. It says Hillel is walking and he sees a skull floating in the water, and he starts to have a conversation with it. So let's understand um, what does this mean? So Hillel the great sage Hillel was actually a reincarnation of the soul of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu. And in fact, they have quite similar um, characteristics. Um, they both were very, very humble and respectful to, to those around them and didn't see themselves as better than anybody, even though they were in important uh, positions of leadership. And funnily enough, they actually both also died at 120. So Hillel, and we as Jews believe in reincarnation and believe that our soul comes back um, into different positions and different bodies to fulfill its mission in this world. And so Hillel, who was a reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu, <clears throat> recognized that this skull that was floating in the water um, and uh, or near the water, I wonder if skulls float, um, was the skull of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh was, rec Moses recognized Pharaoh, and so Hillel was able to recognize this skull as belonging to Pharaoh back in Egypt. And so he spoke to him and teach to teach us all a lesson also that, and he says, because you drowned others, you were drowned. And he says, remember you drowned all the baby boys in the Nile River because you were afraid of the decree, because you were afraid of the, the 
remember the astrologers had told him that um, that a son will be born that will redeem the Jewish people out of Egypt. And so because he was scared of that, he threw all, he decreed all the sons to be thrown into the Nile River. And because he drowned others, ultimately at the end of the Passover redemption, right? When we left Egypt, Pharaoh with all his army chased the Jewish people out and God made a miracle that the sea split and we Jewish people were able to walk through on dry land. And as Pharaoh and his army was fo were following through, God made the sea collapse and drowned all the Egyptians and Pharaoh. And so Hillel is teaching us and teaching him Mida Keneged Mida. I'm sure you've heard um, Mida Keneged Mida, um, which translates as measure for measure. And he says, this is the way of the world. Every action has a consequence. And very often it's similar to what you may have done wrong. And of course it works in the reverse. Every positive action also, midak neged meda, when you do something good for somebody, it gets paid back similarly. And, um, you know, it's funny because when, when I first heard of the phrase or the expression karma, right, which is a worldwide, uh, you know, word that everybody says, this is the idea. This is, we have it in Judaism too. I wonder if, you know, that we also, what you give out to the world comes back to you. And he continues in the text, and those who drowned you will themselves be drowned. And um, this end of the phrase is a reassurance to us, to all those who are reading it. And those, and it is that those who have harmed us as a Jewish people, those who have hated us and become our, been our enemies on a global level, they will be drowned too. God will come and take care of them and um, make them responsible for their actions and they won't just get away with it. Now, of course, it might be in this lifetime or in the next lifetime, we don't know. But we do see that the Romans are no more, the, the Babylonians are no more. There have been nations who have rose, risen up, right, to make our lives difficult, to destroy us. But many of them, almost all of them, have perished. And God reassures us that those who harm you, those who cause pain to you as a Jewish people, will suffer consequences, they will be, um, they will be justice. And also on a personal level, if somebody does something to you that you dislike, or some you experienced injustice on a personal level, they will, God will perform justice. Some, not something will happen to them, but don't worry if you're not able to, um, of course, we have a justice system that we strive to bring everybody needed um, to justice. But God says, even if you're not able to um, eliminate injustices, Hashem will take care of them. You don't need to make sure people are punished for their actions um, beyond you know, the extent of the law. And we need to have a just system. But um, we often experience negativity or... or uh, you know, hostility that we don't need to respond. We don't need to um, punish a person for God ultimately is the one who will make sure that justice is always served. We need to continue doing our best. And uh, <clears throat> there's significance to the fact that Hillel uses the words ultimately, right? He says, ultimately, those who um, drowned you will be drowned. And ultimately tells us that God is in charge, right? It's 
nothing in this world is accidental. God really is the one who makes everything happen. And um, it's actually one of the beliefs in when we say we believe in God, part of believing in God comes with believing that everything happens as a result of God's will. God wants everything to happen and God will take care of things. And um, having that belief is part of believing in God, believing God will take care of us. God will um, create justice in the world. And that is not um, something we need to be very overly, overly concerned with, um, you know, beyond our control. Um, our next um, Mishnah, Mishnah number seven, he would also say, one who increases flesh, increases worms, one who increases possessions, increases worry, one who increases wives, increases witchcraft, one who increases maidservants, increases promiscuity, one who increases manservants, increases thievery, one who increases Torah, increases life, one who increases study, increases wisdom, one who increases counsel, increases understanding, one who increases charity, increases peace, and one who acquires a good name, acquired it for himself, one who acquires the to words of Torah, has acquired life in the world to come. So, so much in this uh, Mishnah, in these words, on a surface level, we could, they are beautiful, a lot of explanations on what each one means, why he's saying this exact wording. But on a general picture, if we just go on an overview, Hillel is teaching us that when we increase in materialism, it um, is not ideal. It ultimately leads to um, a degen, you know, a, 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 what's the word? It leads to difficulties maybe or hardships, right? We can understand, for example, food. You know, if we overindulge in food, it leads to being unhealthy. Um, but in all areas, and, and in fact, um, my... Uh, I remember so clearly when I went to visit my grandparents um, after you know school. Once I flew to Italy to visit them because that's where they live, and I was packing to go back home, and I was having a hard time fitting everything in my suitcase. Right, and my grandfather says, um, turns around, he says, "Marbe." Nesachim Marbe Dagot. He quoted this Mishnah, which said, too many possessions, too many worries. And it was true. I had too many clothes and shoes. And so it increased my worry of how am I going to successfully bring this back home without being overweight, right, in the airport. So when we increase in materialism, it comes to more worries. It comes to um, more problems or, or, you know, things that are not ideal. Whereas when we increase in spirituality, when we increase in Torah, it only brings positivity. It brings wisdom. It brings um, wisdom and understanding and peace. And um, I'm going to end the lesson on that note. Um, and so just a quick recap of what we've discussed today, we've discussed the importance of having a job with Torah, right? And having good quality traits <clears throat> and being respectful with Torah. We also discussed how um, we must be wary of our minds and our hearts, right? Of those in power, because sometimes they may lead us astray. Sometimes the evil inclination might use our mind to rationalize or might use our heart to to uh, tempt us and we need to just be wary of it and not be too impulsive so we make sure we do the right thing and we make the right choices and um, we also discussed judging somebody how we all know that the Pekka vote says that and it says it right here and uh, we also discussed how if there is nobody around being the mensch or being the leader, we need to step up to the plate and do what needs to be done. Also in our homes, we need to act as we would act in public with the similar um, values. Um, and lastly, we concluded with Hillel's experience with the floating skull in the, in the river, 
or in the sea actually. And um, we said how the energy we put out in the world comes back to us measure for measure, the way that we, um, that's the way of the world. And so we can have reassurance that our enemies or those who hurt us um, will get their share um, from God. And we concluded now with how everything is orchestrated by God. And just most recently, we just said how when we increase in Torah, in spirituality, we increase in good things. So does anybody have any questions, anything they'd love to share or add? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining. So good having you here. And I hope you thank have a you. week. Thank you. Take Thank you. And it's just so insightful. It's amazing. I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. You Bye. too. Bye-bye. You.